I'm Umi Perkins. I'm a Hawaiian history teacher here at Kamehameha Schools at uh, the place we call Kapalama. Um, that is the land division that we're on, Kapalama. We have three campuses. Uh, this is kind of the flagship campus. So I've been teaching Hawaiian history here for 16 years. Um, for the past five years, I've been a lecturer also in the, the University of Hawaii system. Um, my background is actually in political science, so I teach political science in, in the UH system. I, I got my PhD in political science uh, in 2013, uh, master's at Harvard in 2002 in government. So um, since that time I've been very active in the, the sort of the Hawaiian history community, do a lot of writing and publishing. Um, I'm kind of known as a blogger as well have a blog called the Umi Burst, uh, but it's all of that has been a way of sort of getting the word out about Hawaiian history because it's a very suppressed field. There, there are all kinds of um, reasons why people, including those in leadership in Hawaii, don't know Hawaiian history, especially if they were in school before the mid '70s. Uh, Hawaiian history wasn't even offered at most schools, and some schools still don't offer it. So that's been a bit of a crusade of mine, is getting the word out about Hawaii's history. And uh, one thing I would say is that a lot of people don't realize just how westernized the Hawaiian kingdom was. Uh, Hawaii was a kingdom unified in 1810. Prior to that, each island was essentially a sovereign. Um, Hawaii was recognized as a sovereign country in 1843 by Britain and France and the United States in 1844. And so when I say westernized, I don't mean in, in a negative way necessarily. Uh, they had a western land tenure system. Um, they had treaties with almost every country that existed at the time, um, including Switzerland, including Italy, um, the states that now make up Germany. Hawaii is actually older as a sovereign state than Germany or Italy. Um, when Germany came into existence, Hawaii had a treaty with Germany. Uh, multiple treaties with Britain, France, and the United States. Five with the United States. Um, and as far as the land tenure system, so we had private property starting in 1848, and that was actually the topic of my research. So. Um, an extension of that was a law called the Kuleana Act, which allowed for the uh, the commoners or the makaenana to obtain land in fee simple without payment. And the reason that they got land for free was that the Constitution had provided that the 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 commoners, along with the nobility and the king, were all the co-owners of all the land in Hawaii. So, in a sense, they were all owners of one-third of all the lands in Hawaii. So the reason they didn't have to pay for land is that they were already the owners of the land. It was simply claiming their inheritance. And so that Kuleana Act is something that's very misunderstood. Um, there are a lot of questions around it in terms of was there a deadline for filing? Um, if, there's, if there's not a deadline, does, do those laws still apply today? That's some of the questions that I looked at. 
Uh, but I also looked at the more of the theoretical basis of of that law. Uh, what was the kind of political theory understanding of um, creating a land tenure system? So that looks into questions of capitalism. You know, Adam Smith, John Locke, um, the idea of rights. The idea of rights is relatively new at that time. The laws prior to that were based on kapu, meaning uh, taboo, what is restricted, whereas rights is about what you are allowed to do, whereas pre previously it was w what you were not allowed to do was the emphasis. So all those um, kind of questions were what I examined. So that did bring my research into the uh, area of, the, of what we call the Big Five. Big Five were five companies, sugar plantations and related companies. Um, it was Alexander and Baldwin, Castle and Cook, uh, Amfac, uh, Theo Davies, and C. Brewer were the five companies. And they had a virtual monopoly on Hawaii's economy. And this was from the period of the mid to late 1800s until basically the mid uh, 20th century, and even into the, going into the late 20th century. And they all still exist. They're all multinational corporations, but they've diversified from the kind of agricultural-based industry that they originally were. There are a few other companies that were if you would say that there was a big six, seven, or eight, that would be companies like Dillingham um, and even the Kumemeha Schools, where we now sit, is actually, actually the largest landowner in Hawaii. So it's an interesting tie there with um, large landed interests. Most of them are sugar, but the largest of them all is a charitable trust um, that uh, if, whose purpose is to educate Native Hawaiian children. So things are a little bit more complex than just uh, big money versus Native Hawaiians. Uh, but the interesting thing about the Big Five was really the how tightly they held their control over Hawaii's economy. Um, they had what we call interlocking directorates. So if you look at the board of directors of one Big Five company and another, there are massive overlaps in who is on those boards. And then if you expand that to lesser companies like Matson Navigation, which till this day brings in most of our um, products, um, or the railroads, or the utilities, um, smaller plantations like Pioneer Mill in Lahaina, or um, McBride Sugar on Kauai. Uh, it's basically the same 30 men on these on the boards of the big five companies who are on all the other boards of all the other companies. Um, so the upshot of all of this was that uh, a connected issue was land was also concentrated. By 1960, 79 owners owned 96% of all the land in Hawaii. It was... Um, the term oligarchy is used here because it was probably the best example of an oligarchy almost anywhere in the world. So people come here and they see the price of housing and there you have it. It's uh, supply and demand. There is very, very little supply available. It's more now, more like 20 to 30 percent of the land is available for purchase, but in 1960 it was only 4 percent was even on the market at all. Uh, the rest of it was tied up in these large trusts which used um, their influence to manipulate the laws so that their tax, uh, their taxes would be very, very low. Um, some of that is still going on today. Um, some of those same companies are involved in the, 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 the newest development boom. There was a big boom in the 60s that followed uh, statehood and then there's been a second boom now with the development of Kaka'ako, so they're building 23 towers. Um, as we speak, and it's the same players with just a few new new ones like Howard Hughes, <clears throat> and they're using the same tricks in terms of um, creating real estate investment trusts that are tax exempt or tax deferred. Uh, so another a, a sort of social result of all of this was that 
those in power uh, had very little interest in providing for the needs of everyday people, uh, their, their employees. So the effect was a very, very underfunded public school system and a fairly overdeveloped private school system. So Hawaii has historically had some of the lowest uh, per capita school spending of anywhere in the U.S. and the highest private school attendance rate. Um, Honolulu has 39% uh, of students in Honolulu go to private school. Um, just by comparison, on the continent it's uh, between 5 and 10%. And most of those are Catholic schools that are relatively affordable, not eighteen to twenty five thousand dollar private schools which is what we're looking at in Hawaii um, that's made Kamehameha extremely competitive to get into because we subsidize our students so so, so Kamehameha becomes a, a pretty central player in many ways in education but also in real estate development they're pretty capitalist to say the least in their um, style of management. They, they've been trying to infuse Hawaiian ideas into that, but uh, still the rules uh, work the way that they do. Yeah, so the Hawaiian Kingdom uh, by the, I'll say the 1860s was uh, the most literate country in the world. Um, that is not the case today at all. Um, in, uh, Native Hawaiians who graduate from public schools in Hawaii, only 9% of them uh, finish college. So that's about a third of the general rate of, in the United States. So Hawaiians are not doing well today. They were doing very well you know, 150 years ago. And part of the reason for that was a, a well-developed school system um, the longest running of those schools is Lahaina Luna, which I attended. It was a boarding school, so it's the only public boarding school in the United States. Um, so the idea is that, that there's a farm there, and you uh, it's a work-study program. So we have chickens and pigs and um, crops. and uh, So it's a pretty old model. I think other schools like Kamehameha was the same way about maybe 90 years ago they were still doing that, other, other schools. But um, a lot of the schools today that people are wanting to attend and that are uh, expensive private schools are schools from the kingdom. Um, Lahaina Luna was the first, although that became public. Um, uh, St. Saint, Saint Louis was uh, founded in 1846. Uh, Lahaina Luna was 1831. Punahou was 1841, that Punahou today is ranked in the top 25 schools in the United States. President Barack Obama was a graduate of it. Um, Iolani was 1867. Um, Sun Yat-sen is a graduate of Iolani. Uh, St. Andrew's Priory was also 1867. That was founded by Queen Emma, who was the wife of Kamehameha IV. Uh, Mid-Pacific Institute, uh, was founded in 1893. Uh, well, it was a blend of a boys' and a girls' school, uh, the Kauai House Seminary. And then they changed their name to Mid-Pac, Mid-Pacific Institute. Um, so a lot of your uh, sort of cherished institutions uh, predate annexation, so, which is very interesting. Um, as for me, uh, the Lahaina Luna experience was pretty formative. Um, it gave me a sort of a basic, basic idea of, of appreciation of Hawaiian history. Um, the first graduate of Lahaina Luna was David Malo, who was, who still to, to the, till today is the, the greatest Hawaiian scholar of all time. Um, he was kind of the connection between the ancient world and the modern world. He was living at the critical moment in between um, where he was young enough to be able to learn how to read and write, but old enough that he could interview people who had lived before Captain Cook had arrived. So he's at that critical juncture there, and a lot of what we know about ancient Hawaii is, is thanks to him. Um, so David Malo is kind of the patron saint of Lahaina Luna, you might say, and um, 
very much a role model of mine. So my mother, um, Le'aloha Apo Perkins, is a very unique uh, figure in sort of the Hawaiian intellectual scene, very much ahead of her time. The idea of a Hawaiian woman with an Ivy League PhD was just unheard of at the time. So I think that um, that's the context that I grew up in, and um, I, I'm, I'm one of the first second generation PhDs. I think I'm the second second generation Hawaiian PhD. Um, because Hawaiians have not been getting PhDs for very long. It just, uh, Hawaiians didn't go to college at one point. It was just something that was not done. That's changing. So there are quite a few Hawaiian scholars now, and the field is starting to get into more specializations instead of generalists. It's getting away from just history into the sciences and other kinds of things. So that's a positive sign. Um, and. Uh, and she was very much at the forefront of that. She knew um, some of the scholars who bridged the gap of the 20th century, uh, people like Mary Kavena Pukuhi, who was working at Bishop Museum in isolation, preserving the culture um, almost single-handedly with the help of that institution. Um, Theodore Kelsey is, um, was a contemporary of some of the great uh, late 1800, early 20th century scholars like Joseph Poipoi, Poi. and I actually knew him personally as a as a child. And that that's just those people have kind of reached legendary status. But at some point, they were just regular people, just doing their thing. And and that's all of us are are that way today, just doing our thing, um, trying to perpetuate some kind of um, uh, you know continuation of uh, showing what Hawaiians really could do. Um, I think the 70s are critical in that way, that that's the, that's the renaissance, that's the flowering time when before that there wasn't any really seen as anything of value in Hawaiian culture. But once you had Hokulea in 76 and the, the realization comes that Hawaiians are the great navigators of the ancient world, not the Vikings, um, that's a game changer. That that is it changes Hawaiians' self perception completely, and especially for men, because it was one of the things that men didn't have much to uh, connect to in the culture. Women had hula, even though hula used to be a male practice, it was not in in the in the twentieth century. Uh, that came back as well. So hokulea was uh, a game changer, and then simultaneously with that was. Uh, Kaho'olawe, which is a kind of politicized aspect of the movement. And I grew up right in the middle of that. My, um, my mother's brother, Peter Apo, was uh, involved with Hokulea, and um, he was uh, living at Makua, which was, um, they were trying to stop the bombing at the time. I used to go and stay there with him, and um, the Renaissance was happening in my youth, and I saw that change where the meaning of being Hawaiian shifted. Um, so that's sort of that, that generational gap between my mother and myself and the people of our two generations. Uh, we saw that shift. The, the younger people today, they think that it's always been this way, <laughs> but it, it has not. Um, there was a time when almost nobody could speak Hawaiian, and now we have thousands of Hawaiian speakers. My daughters can speak Hawaiian. Um, so... Uh, the Renaissance is, is going as strong as ever. Um, and the way that I look at it is <clears throat> Hawaiians are, in a sense, building the infrastructure of a nation within the current structure. And I think Niklaus Schweitzer has said this, that it's evolutionary rather than revolutionary uh, movement. That's a, that's a good way to think about it, that Hawaiians, since, since the 1990s, when people were talking about sovereignty and it seemed like it was right around the corner, they realized that the, the groundwork, building the base of the pyramid still had to be done. Things like economics, things like education, um, health, those things are not glamorous kinds of work. It's not like being a king and being royal. It's, uh, it's 
daily, it's a daily grind, and yet people are, are doing that now. There's a lot that um, is happening now that wasn't happening in 1993 at the 100th anniversary. Now that we're at the 125th anniversary, I don't know if people really appreciate how much has actually changed in that time. In, in 1820, uh, Protestant missionaries from the United States arrived. They were uh, Congregationalists, which is sort of the American version of Calvinists. They were American Calvinists. And they, arriving first, became very influential with the elite at the time. The elite converted to, to that particular religion. And I always wonder if different kinds of missionaries had arrived first, if history would have gone differently. Because uh, that religion basically became the state religion in a sense. The idea of separation of church and state was not in place. The, the missionaries, we're talking about Hiram Bingham and Asa Thurston, uh, the grandfather of Lauren Thurston who ended up uh, overthrowing the kingdom. <laughs> um, they actually didn't really believe in separation of church and state. They were not really normal Americans. They were uh, zealots, you could say. And so in 1829, when Catholic missionaries arrived from France, uh, they were very much discriminated against. And I always imagine what the elite you might, must have been thinking. They must have said, well, th these are Christians. You told us Christianity is good, and they were, missionaries are saying, no, that's the bad kind of Christianity. right? So just don't, don't listen to them. So uh, Catholics for 10 years are not allowed to do any kind of mission work at all. They, they convert a few people uh, just in the countryside, and those people are actually, in some cases, tortured. Um, they're not given any land to build a church or a school. And so in 1839, after 10 years, what some people have called the Dark Decade, uh, they complained back to France, and France sent a gunboat uh, captained by um, Laplace. Uh, the ship was called La Artemis. And um, they threatened the kingdom. And I think they realized, along with the help of some of the missionaries who had uh, left the mission and become political advisors, they realized they had done something wrong in terms of the way that democracies and modern governments are supposed to work. So the former missionary, Jarrett Judd, actually hid some documents that prevented Hawaii from being incriminated and, and actually overthrown by France in 1839. And so they reconciled with the French and uh, they passed a, a law called the Edict of Toleration. So that allowed any form of Christian religion to be practiced in Hawaii. So the upshot of that was the, I believe it was the Marianists uh, were able to start St. Louis. Now they, they were first able to start St. Louis out in a place called Ahui Manu, which is about a two-day trip from Honolulu, so they said, yes, you can have land, but it's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, eventually that school moved I into the city, but um, it was only four years later that uh, three diplomats from the kingdom traveled to France and got recognition from, actually first from Belgium, and the king of Belgium sort of put in a good word with uh, his niece, Queen Victoria, and his cousin, King Louis Philippe, I think it was, and said, um, you know, the Hawaiian Kingdom, they have all the ingredients of being a recognized country. And so Britain and France recognized Hawaii together in a document called the Anglo-Franco Proclamation. And it says uh, that they promised never to take possession of the islands uh, in any form, even a protectorate. Uh, and they have thought it right to consider reciprocally together the Sandwich Islands, which was called at the time, as an independent state. So that was signed on November 28, 1843, and that date became a Hawaiian national holiday called La Kuokoa, which means Independence Day, basically. And Independence Day was a, a day that was celebrated in the kingdom for several decades, but as the sugar planters took control, they, because it was in late November, they said, we're not going to celebrate this anymore. We're now going to have Thanksgiving. 
And so that holiday was sort of overwritten and you might even say colonized. Um, so it's only now beginning, just barely beginning to be recognized. And this year was the, f this past year was the first year Kumemeha ever observed it. Um, so those kind of changes are, are slow. So there are different aspects of Hawaiian culture. Some are considered safe and others are not. If you look at the reception of something like hokulea, there's a unanimous good feeling around it. Um, it's uh, considered an un unqualified good. There's nothing, there's no opposition to bringing back Hawaiian navigation practices. If you look at something like the sovereignty movement, it's a very different case. Um, so at, at Kamehameha, we have a class in Hawaiian culture that ninth graders take. Um, these are 14-year-olds. And then we have a Hawaiian history class that 12th graders take, which are 17, 18-year-olds. And Hawaiian history is much more controversial because now we're talking about the nation state. We're talking about um, how did that nation state cease to exist. Um, normally if you're sovereign, that sovereignty just doesn't vanish um, without a treaty, and yet allegedly that's what happened in Hawaii. So this is, this is very controversial. If there was no treaty of annexation, then legally there was no annexation. And so Hawaii continues to exist uh, under occupation. Um, the idea of Hawaii as a sovereign entity still exists. And so that's a very controversial thing to teach in, uh, in a high school. So um, if we're getting to the question of uh, is there pressure on us to teach certain things, um, I think what a lot of teachers have done is they find their space where they feel like they can do their work. Um, and it's not just Hawaiian history. There are other teachers who find these kinds of spaces. In, in Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian language, you might call them kipuka. A kipuka is a, uh, when there's a lava flow, sometimes the lava flow misses uh, a little space of land. So it's a, a green forest surrounded by lava flow, a very small one. And in that space, things can, life is still happening. The, the devastation hasn't touched it. So as a metaphor, we would call these kinds of spaces where we can practice culture, uh, cultural kipuka. And that's the idea of um, the Hawaiian scholar Daviana McGregor in Ethnic Studies. Um, I think some of our classrooms are like cultural kipuka because we're, we're not high up in the institution. We don't um, have to speak directly to the trustees or to the outside community very much. We can kind of... Uh, do what we feel is right. We have some autonomy. Um, as far as pressure, the, the main pressure is just the structure of the curriculum itself. Uh, we have a U.S. history class. We have advanced placement U.S. history. There are a lot of restrictions on what you can teach in those in that kind of context. It's it, you can't just do whatever you want and turn it into a, some kind of radical Hawaiian class, you have to stay with the parameters of what's uh, required, especially because it's a national standardized test. And um, I'm going to be teaching uh, advanced placement government next year, so I'm going to be experiencing some of those constraints. Um, so I'll see how, how that goes. I'm, I'm going to continue to teach Hawaiian history, though, so uh, it'll be an interesting contrast. <laughs> and then uh, the, the question of the culture. I think the extent to which we can teach Hawaiian culture here is uh, we have quite a bit of leeway and one of the main constraints is simply our schedule, the bells that ring. Um, I used to teach Hawaiian culture, that 14 year old class, and I find it very frustrating because these were 45 minute classes. And Hawaiian culture is not practiced in 45-minute increments. Um, anyone who's been in a, a hula troop or a hula halau, as we call them, knows that you, you do the work until the work is done. It doesn't matter if you stayed up all night. Um, my daughter's uh, hula teacher says hula dancers don't sleep. <laughs> so 
it, it's not about time, it's about the product. And so to try to teach Hawaiian culture, which is supposed to be done that way, within the constraints of a bell schedule is, is very frustrating. That's a small constraint, but it really makes a difference. So we've extended our, our classes now to 80 minutes. So now we have an 80 minute window, which is better, but um, uh, I'm glad that I don't have to try to teach culture within that time frame. It's, it's not really um, a, a culturally appropriate way of doing it. But that's not anything like political pressure coming down on us. Uh, we can talk about um, traditional Hawaiian gods, for example, even though this institution is technically a Christian institution, it's not so zealous that um, they want us to pretend that there were no Hawaiian gods. There are people like that, but um, we're not facing that. So there's uh, kind of good and bad. It is possible, but um, our institution is very, very large, and it's very risk. Um, <laughs> it's a corporation. Um, it's an $11 billion corporation that runs a school, so they're very um, aware of risks. And uh, so they have committees that have to approve anything like that. It's a little bit ironic because we have so many resources, and yet we're very restricted in those, that kind of flexibility. Um, an alternate model is the charter school model, that um, there are 19 Native Hawaiian focused charter schools now, and they have very few resources. They have a per pupil allocation that's much lower than the rest of the public school system. They're sort of like independent public schools, but they have a lot of flexibility. They, because they, they are not um, beholden to the, to the Department of Education and the way that they mandate School, school day should go, they can do those kinds of trips. They can simply get on a bus and drive on a whim. They can do that. Uh, we can't do anything like that. So it, it's a kind of a ironic trade-off. Um, lack of resources means more flexibility in, in this particular case. And my daughter went to one of those schools, and, and I'm very glad she did because she got a very intimate knowledge of the places where she was um, uh, had her Project. So it was one day a week. She would go to a fish pond every every Thursday for an entire year. She knows that place, the legends of the place, the rains, because Hawaiians have names for different kinds of rains, uh, the fish that are there. And then the other year was an uplands year. So every Thursday she was hiking and knew the names of every ridge and the streams and. Uh, that's just not happening with most modern Hawaiian children. You know, they live in the suburbs and they're very, very much suburbanites, uh, indoors, television, video games. Um, they're, they're much more attuned to popular culture than to Hawaiian culture. <laughs> in the 1980s and 90s, there was an exchange with New Zealand and so we had some students who spent uh, either a semester or a year in New Zealand at a school called St. Stephen's. Um, the person who ran that program was trying to get an exchange with uh, Pacific Island, more traditional Pacific Island nations. He spoke to me once about uh, creating an exchange with a school in Tonga, actually the one that my parents taught at. So. Uh, that that didn't pan out, and partly because there was a certain uh, uh, institutional culture here that creates an expectation that everything's going to be first class. You know, um, that's not the reality in um, Pacific Island nations, which have a GDP of two hundred million dollars a year. And two hundred million is what we spend as an institution a year, as one school. Um, and that's the whole GDP of that country. So it's a whole different um, uh, lifestyle. <laughs> and uh, I don't, that's kind of institutional culture issues that a lot of people are, are blind to. That for myself, having been in a lot of different places, I, I can see them clearly. But uh, they say institutional culture is invisible, and so it controls everything. It's, it's one of those issues.
when the conversion happened from um, oral law to written law, and then first it was Hawaiian and then to English, um, that created a lot of problems. There's pretty simple issues of uh, what the translation of certain words mean that have created um, potentially explosive issues. For example, Hawaii had a, a form of land tenure called a life estate, which was ownership of land for your life, but not inheritable. And there was a word in Hawaiian for that that was similar to the word for fee simple, but not the same. And a lot of those lands were simply considered to be fee simple and inheritable when they're actually not. So there are people today who think they own land and actually don't because it traces back to a life estate. And the crux of the problem is the language. Um, and that's just a basic pro problem. If you're talking more deeply in terms of um, uh, cultural understandings, uh, should land really be owned privately? Um, what does it mean to steal land? All, all those things are complex because there's a, there's a kind of a charge out there in the community that foreigners stole land. But technically you can't steal land. Land is um, immovable. So it's either the, the, the subject of a title dispute or you're trespassing. It's not theft. And so, but that's a technicality, right? You can sort of legally steal land and it's still theft in a sense, but it's not legally and technically theft. So um, there's a lot of issues like that. I think um, somebody could come in, and I've tried to do this a bit, come in and kind of explode the whole legal system because it's resting on some shaky foundations in a lot of cases. So when I was in Tonga, I was there from age 9 till 14, and when I was at the beginning of high school, so 13 years old, um, I was the only foreigner who opted to take the Tongan class. The rest of the foreigners were sort of exempt. You could have a free period. But I showed up in the Tongan class and everybody was very impressed. But I slowly realized that the Tongan that I was learning in that class was noble and royal Tongan because the idea was everybody already speaks Tongan, which I did as well. And so uh, that made me lose interest. I thought, I'm not going to be able to use this Tongan. <laughs> so I ended up, um, after a few months, uh, opting out like the rest of the foreign students. Um, I've not really seen evidence that there was a separate royal uh, Hawaiian language. It, um, I've seen letters from the king of Hawaii, and it's pretty legible, like... Um, like what commoners would write. As far as the, uh, the orthography of the language, uh, in, in the 1820s, when the missionaries arrived, they, they were really zealous to write to create a Bible in Hawaiian. And everything leading up to that was just uh, a stepping stone to getting to that. So questions of what the alphabet should be, um, things that should have a lot of thought should have been put into uh, were kind of rushed. I've seen the minutes of a meeting that was about 50 minutes long where they decided that there, not, there aren't going to be any T's in Hawaiian, only K's, when originally there were both T's and K's. So the reason Hawaiian today has so many K's in it is because it's the T's and the K's were alternate to K's. And um, they decided there's going to be the letter P but not B, there's going to be, um, they created what must be one of the shortest alphabets in the world of 12 letters plus a glottal stop. And so um, missionaries are kind of universally praised for creating the written language. It did produce about a million pages of text um, that Hawaiians wrote, but uh, the, there's the downside of it's not really the same language that... Uh, Hawaiians were speaking, and we hear that clearly when we listen to traditional speakers from the Ihau, for example. Um, so I think some uh, Hawaiians have started to call the, uh, what we speak today as a Neo-Hawaiian, 
it's a kind of a book Hawaiian learned from textbooks that's um, it, it's lost some of the organic quality. On the other hand, it's grammatically very well structured. People are speaking correctly, like the king's tongue, uh, king's Hawaiian in a sense, but uh, it's not as spontaneous. I think my dream is connected to my mission. I would I would like to see a Hawaii where um, it's well understood how we got here, uh, because that is not the case at all. There there are all kinds of structural reasons why it's not possible really to transmit Hawaiian history generation to generation, um, and it's it's not intentional. I don't think it's just simply the structure of uh, the fact that. Hawaiian history is considered a social studies subject, so you, you become certified as a teacher in social studies, and to do that you have to study all these other subjects, none of which is Hawaiian history, so um, Hawaiian history ends up being, in a sense, a dumping ground of uh, extra teachers who don't have one more class, they're put into Hawaiian history, uh, because if you really it's, it's sort of a paradox. If you really know Hawaiian history, you probably can't pass the social studies test to become a teacher. It's possible, but unlikely. And then vice versa, if you can pass the test, you probably don't know Hawaiian culture because you wouldn't have spent your time doing that. Um, and the only way you can really do it is to pass the test and then spend your own time teaching yourself the, the history, which is very difficult to do because you have to pull from all these diverse texts and then create the story yourself. Uh, we haven't had a sort of synthetic Hawaiian history book that tells the general entire story since 1969. And, um, I am in talks with the UH University of Hawaii Press to write an update of that book, the new um, general history of Hawaii. Nobody really wants to do it. It's a, it's a pretty big task, but um, I think I'm well positioned to do it, but I'm not, I don't think I'm the perfect person, but um, I, I, could, uh, I could get that job done. That would go a long way because it, I found it's mainly adults who are interested in Hawaiian history, not students. So I'd like to see um, Hawaiian history emphasized more both at the uh, student and the adult level so that we could really have more productive conversations about politics in the present. If we knew how we got here, we could talk about where to go next more intelligently than we're doing now. It, it, it's, um, it's really, really a problem. Um, and that's one of a few things that I'd like to see. Um, it would be part of a larger effort of um, getting the Hawaiian nation, and by that I mean the people, into a better place. Right now, Hawaiians are at the bottom of every social indicator, and that's, uh, that's well known. I'd like to see that change. So there are efforts for um, a sort of restoration of the Hawaiian government, and Switzerland has been one of the most helpful countries in this effort. Um, there was a, uh, in 1999 through 2001, there was a case in the world court um, involving the Hawaiian kingdom. So that alone, the fact that the United, that the Hawaiian kingdom can get into the world court. Now we're talking about the permanent court of arbitration in the Hague, Netherlands, um, which is one of three main world courts. Um, the fact that Hawaii could get into that court is sort of tacit evidence that Hawaii is still a country because that court is not for domestic issues. And then there was going to be a second part of the, uh, of the trial uh, this, this year, in 2018. On January 17th, which was the 125th anniversary of the overthrow, there was planned to be a, the first hearing of... Uh, of the second part of this case, but um, something happened 
most likely the United States intervened and said, don't hear this case, and the Secretary General of the Permanent Court canceled the proceedings, even though they had already been approved, the judges had been selected, and they had gotten very, very top-notch judges. So in the area of um, international intrigue, um, in, in subtle ways, Switzerland's been helpful, and, and Italy has as well. Um, and I'll just give you an example of that. Um, Hawaii had a treaty with Italy, as I've said, and until a couple of years ago, that treaty was in the treaty library in the section of canceled treaties. But an Italian researcher looked into this issue that I'm talking about and informed the government, and they moved that treaty into the active treaty section of their treaty library, which is in Turin or Torino, uh, former capital. And so in, in small ways like that, European countries have been more helpful than other countries. 